Hello, Buckeye fans, and welcome to another episode of the Bucknuts Happy Hour. I'm Patrick Murphy here with you today. We're going to talk some Buckeyes. First, we're going to crack a beer. I'm going with PBR again today, second week in a row. I ended up with a bunch of PBRs in my fridge, and I figure this is a good time to drink them. Funny story, last week I didn't finish my PBR because I did so much talking, not enough drinking, and I left the glass with a little bit of PBR sitting on the table here, and I got yelled at by my uh, wonderful girlfriend for leaving that out. So today, I need to remember to take time, have a couple drinks during the show, get it finished before we're done, or finish it afterwards, I guess, but maybe finish it during... All right, so we have entered spring practice for the Buckeyes. We're going to talk about what we saw, what we heard from the first two spring practices this past week. We were out there um, for both sessions, not the entire practice, but we'll get into it. We will dive into kind of what is real from what we saw and heard, and maybe what is more talk during spring ball uh, that maybe won't carry over to the fall. And I'll get into a little more of what I mean with that. Towards the end, I want to talk about the Buckeye basketball teams. The women's basketball team, as we record this on Friday, March 8th, is about to tip off against Maryland in the Big Ten tournament. I will uh, keep you up to date on that when we get to that. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about the men's team kind of what needs to happen for this team to get into the college football, or excuse me, not the college football playoff, the NCAA tournament. Still a long shot, I think, but we'll get into that. I keep getting asked about it, and so I figure talk about that a little bit. If you have any questions about the Buckeyes, about anything from spring practice, um, any, any of that stuff, if you're watching this live, feel free to throw them in the chat. I will try and get to some of those as we get to the end here. But let's dive into the football practices that began this week as I finish pouring the PBR here. Um, Exciting, first of all. I want to say that. Uh, To get back out there, we talked about this when we did the instant reaction show with Dave and Steve earlier this week. But just to be back out at the Woody, you know, we've gone over there since the season ended a few times for interviews. Uh, we talked to Ryan Day on National Signing Day. We talked to James Laurinaitis, uh, Matt Guerrero. We talked to the, the incoming transfers. But to go out there and have football happening again. And look, it's early. It's the start of practices. Um, there's not a ton that's happening right now. But it's still football, which is better than no football. I think we can all agree on that. Cheers to football. Um, uh, so this time of year, there's a lot that we see that we hear from coaches, things like that, that I think when you look back on it, come the fall or, you know, think back to last year at this time, you know, there was a lot of talk about the Jack and, and when they would install that position on, on the defense and, you know, the quarterback stuff and things like that, um, that, you know, you get into the fall and, and that stuff all kind of falls by the wayside. Now there's also things during spring practice that you see and hear that end up being significant in terms of how the season plays out or what happens in the season. Um, you know, to going back to last off season, Kyle McCord, there was, there was that battle with Devin Brown. That was real, right? We, we, what we saw from Kyle McCord, whether you think Kyle McCord had a good season or not, he ended up being the starting quarterback. So there was stuff to take away that actually contributed to the season. And then there was stuff that got talked about, you know, maybe positions and guys doing some different things that maybe didn't ever materialize. That doesn't mean they weren't real when we talked to the coaches about them or when we saw them out at practice, but they're just things that didn't actually end up impacting the season in any meaningful way. So I want to go through some, some things and kind of, Factor fiction, you know, will we see this play out come the fall? Will it not? Um, and let's keep in mind here, we are two days into spring practice. There are 13 more practices, including the spring game on April 13th. So there's going to be a lot more. We'll have interviews with more guys. We'll see more. Uh, so there'll be a lot more information as we go along the uh, throughout throughout the, the spring. I want to start where I think everybody's conversation likes to go first, and that is with the quarterbacks. 
first two days of spring practice, we get out there. You've got five scholarship quarterbacks, right? Will Howard, Devin Brown, Lincoln Keen Holtz, Aaron Nolan, Julian Sayan. Those are your five. More than I can remember the Buckeyes having and, and probably more talent than I can remember the Buckeyes having in that quarterback room. And that quarterback room's been pretty good, right? We get out there the first day of spring practice. It was pretty clear from the start that Devin Brown was going first in drills. Um, now, we didn't see them go seven on seven. We didn't see them go 11 on 11. The little bits that we did see where they lined up uh, the first team offense against the second team defense in the, on one side of the field, and then the second team offense against the first team defense on the other side of the field, it was really just lining up. They, they snapped the ball, kind of moved a little bit, and then everybody stopped and, and they got lined up again. So it's tough to really read things. But with quarterbacks, the way they organize things, if, if you're not familiar with kind of how football practices are run, you know, when they go through drills, one guy goes first, right? And that guy is usually the starting quarterback. Now, in the offseason, that changes um, through quarterback battles. We saw last offseason, Devin Brown, Kyle McCord kind of rotate through that. We get out there, and it's pretty clear. I think almost every time, there probably were a few times where Will Howard went first. Uh, Devin Brown was the guy. Now, what does this mean looking forward? I think we should probably take it with a grain of salt. It was the first two days of spring practice. Devin Brown is a guy who's now been in the program for this is going to be his third year. Cheers to Devin Brown. And Will Howard is entering his first year in the program despite having four seasons of college football under his belt. Cheers to uh, Will Howard. So I think that, you know, like with a lot of positions, they kind of go with the incumbent guys to start with whether that's to send a message to any newcomers, hey, look, you got to earn your spot. That's true with a lot of freshmen as well. Um, or if it's just because, look, Devin Brown knows where to be for drills because he's done it over and over and over again, and he can kind of lead the way even for a guy like Will Howard, who's done probably very similar drills back at Kansas State, but not exactly the same thing. So I don't think you need to be, you know, if you're a big Will Howard person, I don't think you need to be alarmed by this. But – I do think that this is more of a quarterback competition than a lot of people thought going into spring practice. And I say that not based on the order in which they go, but from the little bits we've seen of these quarterbacks throwing on the first day of spring practice, they had a drill where they have like a, a large net with a hole to catch the ball in. And so basically you're aiming for a small, you know, area to kind of fit the ball into I don't think Devin Brown missed on, on his throws. Um, Will Howard, good, not great, I would say, from, from that drill. And we'll get into some of the other guys as well here in a minute. But you know, I was really impressed with Devin Brown, the way the ball came out and the accuracy you know, hitting that spot each time he went. And I think they did two in a row, and then the next guy went, and then you know so on and so forth. Um, but very impressed by that. They also had a drill on Thursday – where two quarterbacks lined up next to each other. They had receivers running basically the same route. And so you could literally, and they, they were throwing to those receivers. So you could literally see side by side, these guys throwing the ball and Devin Brown and Will Howard next to each other, a decent amount. And look, Will Howard certainly has some pop when it comes out of his hand. You can tell he's got a little bit of, uh, you know, he's got an arm on him. The There's no doubt about that, but I thought Devin Brown was the more accurate of the two and natural too. And, and the ball is coming out really nicely from Devin Brown. And, and let's remember with Devin Brown, we haven't really seen him, right? Uh, I wrote about uh, this, this, this past week, you know, Devin Brown, every time he's had this opportunity to, you know, get in front of fans to have an opportunity in a game, something's gone wrong, right? The spring game last year hurts his finger. Can't play in the spring game. Fans don't get to see him. We don't get to see him in, in, in a game. Last season, he starts to develop a little bit of a role as that red zone quarterback. Yeah, they're not going to see a ton from that, but at least he's a part of the offense that way. Gets hurt um, against Penn State. Misses basically the rest of the year. Um, and then comes out in the Cotton Bowl. First start, we're going to see what Devin Brown's got. Devin Brown injures the other ankle this time and, and doesn't get his opportunity. So... You know, I know there's people out there that think, well, Devin Brown couldn't beat Kyle McCord. He's obviously not that good. Well, Devin Brown was entering his second year in the program, 
Um, and, and look, I'm not saying that Devin Brown will be the starting quarterback. I'm saying that this is a bona fide quarterback competition. And had you asked me earlier this offseason after Ohio State brought in Will Howard, I would have said, look, you know, Devin Brown will have his opportunities, but Will Howard is winning this job because you don't bring in a guy like that with one season of eligibility left to you know play backup and you know, you watch from the sideline. That's not what Will Howard's here for. I will say, though, the Buckeyes don't owe Will Howard anything. There were no promises made to Will Howard other than you have the chance to win this job and compete here uh, at Ohio State. And if they go through these spring practices and they go through fall camp and Devin Brown is the better quarterback, Devin Brown will be your guy. Now, if I'm betting, I would say that Will Howard is still the favorite to win the job. Again, it was only two days of spring practice. We only saw about 30 minutes of each practice, but I still think this is more of a quarterback competition than I think most people expected. Uh, Real quick, Wayne Snyder said he gets hurt too much. It's actually interesting. We talked with Devin Brown about this. Kids never had um, injury issues. You, know, you go back through high school. Look, the finger thing, it happens to quarterbacks all the time, right? Um, you know, you see it in the NFL, I think, more frequently than any time. A, a hand throwing the ball hits a helmet. And, you know, I think, look, if that weren't the spring game, if that were a real game last uh, last spring, I think Devin Brown finds a way to play in it if the Buckeyes need him to. Um, the ankle things, you know, he's talked about the fact that he's never had ankle issues before. Um, you know, it's been two kind of, as he put it, kind of freak injuries, whereas cleats got stuck in the turf, um, his ankle twists wrong when he gets tackled, and you know, now he's he's missing time. Uh, he said he's wearing different shoes, closer to like offensive lineman shoes as opposed to the sort of speed wide receiver shoes he was wearing before. Um, but yeah, it's not like he has a long track record of injuries. It's really just been an unfortunate timing of these injuries. Um, you know, if Devin Brown hurts his ankle in the off seat, you know, in between or maybe in the spring game, you know, it's not as big of a deal, right? It's it just happened when he's had these opportunities. So look, it's, it's unfortunate, uh, but I'm not ready to label Devin Brown as an injury prone guy at this point, because it, you know, the, the track record, you know, there's really two injuries, right? The two ankle injuries. So you hope for his sake he can stay healthy and really compete because I do think it helps Ohio State to be the best possible offense they can if you have two quarterbacks that are really pushing each other to be the starter. Um, I do think that Ryan Day, Chip Kelly need to probably handle it a little bit better. Obviously, they can't decide when a quarterback wins the job, but you know, I didn't I just didn't like the way they went into last season and kind of telling Devin Brown he was going to play. And then clearly Kyle McCord was the starter. That's a conversation we've had before and don't need to rehash, but I did want to address the, the Devin Brown gets hurt too much thing. Cause I think it's, you know, based on what we've seen, it's kind of a fair narrative, but if you look at his entire playing career, it hasn't really been an issue um, sticking with the quarterbacks. So I would say the, you know, I would say that the starting two quarterbacks, potential starting two quarterbacks, Devin Brown, Will Howard, um, what we've seen of Devin Brown start, you know, leading the line, so to speak, is I won't say it's fiction because I do think he has a chance to win the job. Um, but I do think, you know, th this is a bigger quarterback battle than, than we thought. As we go down the line of the quarterbacks, the way it kind of played out was, you know, Devin Brown, Will Howard, Lincoln Keenholz, Julian Sayan, the Alabama transfer and Air Nolan, both the last two being freshmen. Um, at times, Air Nolan was on his own, throwing with, uh, you know, in other drills, working with some of the running backs and things like that, um, when the other four quarterbacks were, were doing some passing things. I don't know if that's a pure numbers game. I don't know if that's, you know, Air Nolan is, is really at the bottom of the depth chart and the other four are ahead. I can't imagine there's been that kind of delineation at this point. It may just be an opportunity to get, uh, Aaron Nolan, some extra throws in there while the other guys are doing other things. Cheers. Uh, but when you look at those three, I think right now you can clearly see, you know, I'd even put it as Will Howard and, and Devin Brown is kind of a category of their own Lincoln Keenholz in his own category. And then the two freshmen, kind of by themselves 
Um, and maybe Julian Sayan has is a little bit ahead, ahead of Aaron Nolan. Like if I I imagine if they were filling out a depth chart today, that is how that would look. Um, as we go forward, I think you may see some separation there. Uh, look, I think the two freshmen right now, uh, even though Ryan Day said, you know, you can't tell guys you're going to come in and compete and then make them, you know, take all the third team reps. I, I think you can. Um, you know, I don't think either freshman, despite their confidence level, if you, if you could get their true honesty, believes that they're going to start day one next fall. Uh, not to say it can't happen, certainly happened in the past and, you know, happened at programs across the country every year. But to me, it, it, you just have too much in that room right now. Um, I don't know if there's really a fact or fiction there, but I just kind of wanted to lay out how it was working. I thought every quarterback has made some decent throws. Again, small sample size based on what we're allowed to watch. Um, you know, I think Julian Sayan has been impressive in terms of the the limited work we've seen. Um, Aaron Nolan, still, still some work to do. It's also weird seeing a left-handed quarterback out there. Just looks different. Um, but yeah, I think that depth chart right now, other than the top two, which is still kind of and or at this point, that's kind of the, if we're going factor fiction in terms of how it will play out in the fall, assuming all five of these guys stay, obviously, uh, you, you would, you would go with the starter being Aaron Ol or excuse me, starter being Will Howard or Devin Brown, Lincoln Keenholz as the third. And then the two freshmen, a notch below that. And I don't even think you need to include them on a hypothetical depth chart that they don't actually put out. So that's kind of the way I see the quarterback position right now. Again, two practices in. I want to flip over to the defensive side of the ball and talk about the way that they're going to, to set up. Because Jim Knowles made some comments this week about <clears throat> the, the defense and, and you know, I know it, it created some buzz and I think this is where spring practice can be exciting, but also maybe be a little bit misleading. So Jim Knowles was talking about uh, Sonny Styles, CJ Hicks, and he said Sonny Styles and CJ Hicks are competing for that same uh, will linebacker spot, but that because both of them are, are talented and versatile that he's been thinking about, the possibility of, of using them, he called it a double eagle, using them, or no, sorry, that wasn't the double eagle. We'll get to the double eagle. He talked about using them both on the field with Cody Simon, uh, which I think is interesting because that goes back to more of the three linebacker sets. I don't know if you need that as much in the Big Ten as you once did, especially given you know Wisconsin has changed the way it looks under Luke Fickle. I imagine that will change even more. Um, you look at, you know, what will Michigan be next year? Obviously, Sharon Moore, he's an offensive line guy, so they still a little power heavy. But you, you didn't need three linebackers that much against Michigan anyway. You know, there's just there's not as many teams that line that line up in power sets and require three linebackers on the field as they used to. But CJ Hicks, Sonny Styles aren't your typical linebackers, right? I mean, Sonny Styles has played safety, CJ Hicks in high school is playing all over the field. So I think that there's something interesting there. And then the Eagle double Eagle that Jim Knowles also talked about was, can you get three defensive tackles on the field? And he was specifically talking about hero canoes development. Um, so hero canoe with Ty Hamilton, Tyleek Williams, and then teaching Jack Sawyer and JT Tuamalau to be sort of stand up outside linebackers, something he said he thinks would, you know, give them more versatility, help them uh, as they move on to the NFL. Cheers. So, you know, another thing that like, as soon as you hear it, you start, you know, scribbling down and you're thinking, okay, how could this work? Um, and Knowles made it clear, you know, this is something he's thought of. It's not something they've worked on. Uh, I, for me, this is one of those things that sounds great during spring practice, during the off season, we talk about it. People will write about it. I talk about it. I write about it, those type of things. And then you get to the fall and, you know, maybe you see it once or twice, 
but I, I, I just don't think that this is something that's going to really come to fruition. Um, how often is Ohio State going to need to go with three defensive tackles, two, uh, you know, two defensive ends replacing, you know, I don't even know who necessarily they would, would, uh, would replace on the field. So, you know, for me, this is like a fun thing to think about, but will it ever happen? Will you ever see it? I doubt it. Um, will you ever see Sonny Styles and CJ Hicks on the field together? I think there's a better chance of that than you would seeing three defensive tackles and the, the linebacker or the defensive ends replacing um, linebacker, so to speak. I, again, I think it's fun to think about. It takes me back to, I remember heading into the big 10, it was at the big 10 media days heading into the, I guess it was the 2015 season, maybe 2014. I don't remember um, exactly, but urban Meyer, I think it's the tweet that has had generated the most, my tweet that generated the most buzz ever. Urban Meyer talked about getting, I believe it was Cardell Jones and JT Barrett on the field together. Maybe it was one of those two in Braxton Miller. I don't remember exactly what it was, but I remember everyone kind of, as soon as he said it, it was like the people standing around the table he was sitting at where, you know, everyone got their phone or people were jotting stuff down and, you know, it created a bunch of articles about what this could look like and discussion and things like that. Never happened. It was never going to happen. It was just this idea in the off season, probably something they messed around with. Um, you know, I, I, this isn't quite that extreme because these are things that you could obviously do three linebackers. Isn't that, that uh, different than, you know, a, a normal defense, but you know, Jim Knowles made it clear. They are still a four two five defense in base. And I don't think you're going to see them get out of it that much. They didn't get out of it that much last year. They are set up to play that way, um, you know, with with the defensive line coming back, with the linebackers that they have. They still have to figure some things out there, but certainly have some linebackers uh, there. And obviously, you know, the secondary and, and all the talent there. You know, I'm not sure you want to take those guys off the field and ask, you know, JT Tumalau, who, look, has an interception in his career, that's more than some of the cornerbacks on the roster. But do you want him dropping into coverage just to have three defensive tackles on the field? I don't know. It just doesn't – It's again, it seems like a cute thing to talk about now that never really plays out. And, you know, sure, maybe they'll practice it at some point. But I would be surprised if you see much of any of either of those really, maybe some three linebacker sets. But it, th to me, those are more of the fiction things that – uh that then something that's realistically going to be played out during the fall back on offense. Um, I don't know how much this has gotten talked about elsewhere. You know, we haven't talked about it a ton, but Will Kazmarek, uh, I talked about him last week when I was going through the transfers cheers. And that I think he will be Ohio state's starting tight end. I was a little bit surprised that when we got out there on Tuesday, there was no, hiding, sugarcoating anything about Will Kazmarek. He was the number one tight end. Uh, now, that may say a lot about Will Kazmarek. That may say a lot about some of the issues with the other tight ends and maybe just not quite ready. And, you know, this is a guy who's obviously played and started for two years at Ohio University. Obviously, that's a big jump up from the MAC to the Big Ten, but he's got size He's got athleticism. Uh, you know, he does the things you want him to do. So for me, this is probably one of the more of this week, this first week of practice. One of the more honest things we saw is that he is, uh, you know, he is tight end one and you know, they're, they're not hiding that you flip to the defensive side. This is no surprise, but Caleb Downs was, was out there with the first team and, in the uh, in the secondary at that safety position, that just your safety position that Josh Proctor played. You know. Now Malik Hartford is not doing everything. Um, they said he was going to be out, though he was on the field some. I imagine once they put pads on and start doing contact stuff, he will not take part after I believe it was a shoulder shoulder surgery that he had following the season. So you know, there's not a ton of competition for for Caleb Downs there, but. I think those two, no, no sugarcoating it. 
those are your top players at each position. And unless someone unseats them, which I don't think happens, I think you can say that that is a fact. Those will be your starters. Will Kaczmarek, the starting tight end, Caleb Downs, starting safety. And while we're talking about Caleb Downs, I mentioned, you know, Will Kaczmarek, athletic, uh, can, can kind of do all the things you want. Probably not going to catch a ton of passes, but, um, you know, will will catch some, probably enough to keep them honest, keep defenses honest, and, you know, will be a blocker and all that. But seeing Caleb Downs out there on the field, you know, look, I watched him for Alabama last week. I talked, or last year, I talked about that last week. but seeing him in a Buckeye uniform on the field, you know, just moving around up there. He's just, he's different. He's different. I don't know how else to describe it. You guys will see it when you see, if you haven't watched him much, you will see it when you, you know, watch spring game and, and obviously next fall. Um, I think he can be, <laughs> this I think is a fact. I think he can be a major difference maker in this secondary, um, a secondary that was already really good, right? The number one ranked pass defense in the country last year. And look, say what you will about big 10 quarterbacks. The Buckeyes did the job they needed to do throughout the season to ensure that you know, teams didn't throw the ball on them. You know, statistically the best pass defense in the country. Cheers. Um, so really impressed with Caleb Downs. I knew I would be, but just seeing him in person and, you kind of again, not much being done, not even pads on, but going through the motions. He's he's special the way he, you know, finishes drills and and things like that. Um, you know, he just gets it. He's a young, still a young guy, but has experience and knows what it takes to be successful um, in this sport. Uh, another position with a transfer player is at center, and Seth McLaughlin came in this off season. We talked about him last week. Had the snap issues with Alabama. I'm not worried about that now that he's moved to Ohio State and, and whatnot. Um, but when we when they did line up with the first team offensive line, it was uh, Carson Hinsman, who started last year for the Buckeyes, obviously, as the number one center both days. And this is one where I think I, I'm torn a little bit because I do think that Carson Hinsman has a shot and I'll get to that in a second, but you, know, you, you brought in Seth McLaughlin to play center for this team and he's got the experience. He's done it. He's won an sec title. He's played in the college football playoff. Um, those are things that, that Carson Hinsman has not. And, you know, Carson Hinsman, it'd be one thing if Carson Hinsman had gone out and had, you know, Luke Whipler type of first year starting, he got better as the season went on, but he wasn't great. There's obviously a reason behind him not playing in the Cotton Bowl. And some of that may have had to do with some disciplinary things. You know, the podcast he went on, the unsanctioned podcast he went on. I don't know. I don't, you know, I, I you can speculate on that if you want. For whatever reason, he didn't play in the Cotton Bowl. From what Ryan Day has said, he's come back and responded very well. He was great in the winter workouts. He started camp well. They're very pleased with him building off of his first year as a starter. So, you know, again, I think probably still a little fiction. I think more likely than not, you have Seth McLaughlin as your starting center week one for the Buckeyes. But, you know, I don't know if this is entirely just Seth McLaughlin's, the re or excuse me, um, uh, Carson Hinsman is the returning starter. And if you're going to unseat him as a transfer player, you have to unseat him. Um, I think there may be more to it than that. And, and that they've been impressed with Carson Hinsman in his second, you know, coming into his second year of really playing redshirted his first year. Uh, I, I think that there, there may be, you know, something behind that. And, you know, you do the right things, especially after a year of starting, you know, maybe, you know, something clicks or, you know, you, you just recognize that, after the cotton bowl and, and not playing in that, that you've got to, you've got to change your approach or, or whatever it may be. And now all of a sudden you've got a guy that started for a year within your program competing with the guy who started year and a half at Alabama. You know, he's a Carson Hinsman already knows all the calls. He's done this. He snapped it to some of these guys before. Um, you know, I think that, that that could be a real, like I said, with the, these top two quarterbacks, I think that could be a real 
interesting competition, more interesting than I think people thought going into spring. Um, we'll follow that one pretty closely because, you know, again, I'd still probably bet on Seth McLaughlin being the starting center when the season begins, but I want to see how it plays out and, and kind of what the evolution is uh, of that. And then I guess the next question is, whoever loses that job, <clears throat> where do they play, right? Um, because both could play guard, but that's not really what either have done, especially at the college level. Seth McLaughlin talked about, you know, he's been a center since he was like four years old, five years old, whatever it was. Um, you know, he's taken reps at guard in Alabama's practice, but he's never played in a game at guard. You're going to move him to guard now. I guess you could, uh, same with, with Carson, Carson Hinsman. He's probably done some guard stuff in practice, but you know, he, he's their starting center last season. He didn't play any guard at any point. So, uh, that, that, like I said, we'll, we'll monitor that one closely. I think it's an interesting battle again, probably not what I expected coming in to spring practice. Uh, the guard position though is interesting. And this is another one. Luke Montgomery was the starting right guard or was the first team right guard, um, out there. Had you asked me going into spring practice, I would have said, I think Luke Montgomery will be your starting right tackle. And they moved Josh Fryer to right guard. Josh Fryer, who had success playing right guard two years ago, if you remember, I think he started for Matthew Jones one game and then basically came in for him pretty early on in another. Um, I thought he played better in that position than he did last year starting at right tackle. Now, again, like with Carson Hinsman, you come off of a year with a, or a full year of starting, you know, you, you, you watch your film, you do these, th there's ways to improve after that year that you're not just stuck as that player. Right. So it's certainly possible that Josh Fryer has put in the work and is starting to look more of the part of the right tackle. Uh, there's also, and, and this was pointed out on, on the Bucknuts message board, um, in the last couple of days, you know, Luke Montgomery is pretty athletic for, uh, an offensive lineman. And if you play him at guard, you could do some of the pulling stuff probably a bit easier than with some of the other guards Ohio state's had. He's a guy, you know, he, he can get out and move in space pretty well. And so maybe that's the thinking with, with kind of that setup on the right side of the offensive line. Look, Josh Fryer, Fryer has played right tackle. He knows what it takes now. He's got to go do it and put in the work this offseason. You're starting to see that from him. And you're seeing, okay, right tackle um, from Ohio State – or right tackle, right guard, excuse me. Um, too many too many similar positions. Right guard, we need somebody who can move there. Luke Montgomery deserves a chance to be on the field. He's one of the best five. Oh, and he's athletic enough to do some of the things that we like to do with those guards. Uh, you know, it's it makes for an interesting conversation. I could also see justification for flipping those two and you know, saying Luke Montgomery, better tackle, right guard, Josh Fryer, because we've seen it before. Um, I said on Tuesday when we did the Bucknuts incident reaction that I didn't like Luke Montgomery is much at right guard than I did right tackle. <clears throat> but thinking about the athleticism part of it, like I said, somebody brought that up on, on the front row. Maybe there is an argument there. Um, so, you know, if, if you're going to ask me for the starting five group, I think that's probably pretty close unless somebody emerges that we, we don't see. Um, again, you could move some guys around, but I do think, you know, obviously on the, on the left side, you have Donovan Jackson at left guard and Josh Simmons at, at left tackle. Um, so I would say that that's probably closer to fact of at least that five. Now, again, the center position, I think, I think is probably up in the air depending on how spring goes, but certainly, um, you know, certainly, certainly seems to be a bit more sorted early than, um, than maybe we would have thought. And we'll see again two practices in, I always have to remind myself, let's not get too crazy about things. 
and, you know, try and read into depth charts and, and whatnot, especially this early, but really at all through spring. Like it's not the time that they, they put that all together. Um, so those are kind of the, the way I see it with, with Ohio state and just factor fiction. Um, I think we'll learn a lot more throughout spring practice. Um, and, you know, again, I think we'll still have questions going into the fall and starting fall camp and whatnot. Uh, again, if you have any questions, I saw there were a few of them there. I think I touched on some of them already, but if you do have questions and you're watching this live with us, throw them in the chat. I will address some of them at the end here. Uh, I do want to touch on some basketball here briefly. Uh, and, and the women are currently playing Maryland in the big 10 tournament and it is not going well. Uh, it is 38 30 Maryland in the third quarter. Um, Buckeyes are shooting 34% from the court. Maryland 40, 43% now as they go up 40 to 30. Um, so not what you want from the Buckeyes in their first game in the big 10 tournament. Look, if this women's team, uh, drops out in the first round of the early, you know, what is this? The third round, I guess at their first opportunity in the big 10 tournament, certainly a disappointment, especially after the way that uh, the season has gone and winning the big 10 regular season tournament and, and all that you, know, you do lose to Iowa, which ends the winning streak at the end of the regular season on the road. Uh, I don't think that this means that this team can't make a NCAA tournament run. Now, maybe it does affect the seating a little bit because obviously losing this early. Um, you also would like to keep the momentum, you know, pick the momentum back up and kind of keep things rolling here in the big 10 tournament. Even if you don't win the whole thing going out in the first, first possible chance means you, you know, you're off for, for quite a while here before the NCAA tournament gets going, but not what we expected from the women. Um, they've now closed it to 40, 35 with just under eight minutes to go in the third so if you're not watching that, I believe it's on the Big Ten Network. You can uh, you can tune into that right now as the women, if you're watching this live, as the women try and come back against the Terps. As for the men, I keep getting asked like, what percentages do you put on? What percentage do you put on the men being able to make the NCAA tournament? What has to happen for the men to make the NCAA tournament? I would say, um, you know, I, I don't know what the number is, but like. It's not good. You know, they put themselves in a pretty big hole here. And um, I wrote about today, if, if you want to go read it over on Bucknuts, kind of how Jake Diebler has turned things around. Um, you know, I talked to some people behind the scenes, also talked to Jake Diebler about it. And you know, I think there's there's some interesting stuff in there, you know, in terms of kind of the the stuff that you probably don't think about a ton. Obviously, he's done some things with with the team and um you know, in terms of the pace that they're playing and, and the intensity and urgency and whatnot. And I think that certainly played a part, but there's kind of some more, you know, mental things behind the scenes stuff that have happened that have contributed to, you know, the, the four and one record that, that Jake Diebler has as the interim head coach. Uh, let's say cheers to that, to the four and one record. So I think if you just want to get yourself into the conversation on the bubble, You've got to win at Rutgers on Sunday. You then probably have to win. I've said two to three tournament game, big 10 tournament games. I think you may need to win three. And that means, or, you know, or at least get to the semifinal again, which is what the Buckeyes did last year. I think that is what puts the Buckeyes in the conversation for the tournament. Uh, that doesn't mean they get in. I saw a projection earlier this week of big 10 teams in and it could be the lowest it's been in several years. Um, there's a lot of other good teams around the country. You know, I mean, I saw Gonzaga is a team that's on the bubble. You don't normally see that. Right. So it's going to be tough for Ohio state to, to climb out, you know, obviously winning the big 10 tournament would be a remarkable and B really get you into the, you know, that's a lock if you can do that. So I would say that's your safest bet to getting in, but yeah, I think you do have to, you have to do something pretty impressive here at the end of the season, right? Excuse me, drinking the beer too fast. Um, you know, if you could win, what are they four and one now? You win at Rutgers, 
win three games. So that's eight, eight wins in nine games headed into the NCAA tournament. Um, you know, I, I do have to think that then on selection Sunday, they have some conversation um, about the Buckeyes. Whereas, you know, a couple weeks ago, they were just not even a thought. So like, A, it's impressive that we're even talking about this and, and what they've done. You know, I think the win against Purdue helps. I think going to Michigan State and getting a win helps, um, even though it's not your, your normal dominant Michigan State team. Definitely beating Nebraska at home helps. This isn't the best Rutgers team right now, um, but I think you, you know, what a Rutgers is. Actually, it's Rutgers is below Ohio State now in the, in the tournament, seven and 12 um, in the conference, overall 15 and 15. So, you know, that win is just one where you get a road win, which is important, and you beat a team below you in the standings. And additionally, you know, that win, I think then, you know, you're out of that first day of the, Big Ten tournament, I believe, which which is helpful. So they need to continue this run is basically what needs to happen and push things as far as they can into the Big Ten tournament. And then, you know, at no point are they going to be a lock to be in. But if you can make a good run in that Big Ten tournament and you can finish this with a win on Sunday, I think you make it pretty interesting. And look, you know, the name brand isn't supposed to be a part of this and isn't entirely a part of it. But People are human, right? And you're looking at two schools. One of them is Ohio State, and one of them probably isn't a brand as big as Ohio State. You know, I've never been in the NCAA tournament selection committee room, but I do have to imagine that kind of creeps into the back of people's minds. Um, yeah, they don't care necessarily about the ratings, but you know, could this a hot Ohio State team make it? Um, and I think there's another question here. Would you rather see Ohio State as a, you know, whatever, low seed go into the NCAA tournament and, you know, you're, you're just hoping to win a game? Or would you like to see Ohio State go into the NIT with this group, a young group that can get some more tournament, uh, tournament experience, go into the NIT probably host another in-state team in the first round, maybe play a uh, Thad Mata coached Butler in the second round, um, and then maybe you make a run and, you know, you, you, you know, push to a NIT tournament final four or something along those lines. And, you know, you've got some good feelings going into the offseason with this group. Look, I think you always want to be in the big dance, right? That's that's the goal for all of these kids. But if we're talking about beyond this year, and, and you know, I remember that that team, that Ohio State team, the year after, um, you know, the Greg Oden, Mike Conley year that that won the NIT. You know, talking to some of those guys about how that you know, got things going for the next year. Um, you know, I, I think there could be some, some value in that, especially if you have some pretty intriguing matchups, like I, I said, and there's no guarantee that that's how it works, but they do try and keep things regionally. So, you know, I would not uh, mind seeing Thad Mata and Butler, you know, I think that would be fun from my perspective of looking for storylines for sure. Um, but you know, I, obviously you want to be in the big dance if you can do it, it's just going to take a, a continued run and, it's not out of the question anymore. Certainly not out of the question, which again, impressive. And, and if you want to know kind of what's been happening, how this is happening behind the scenes, um, I think you uh, you should read my story over on Bucknuts about Jake Diebler. I'm going to get into a couple of the questions. If you have any more, feel free to throw them out there. Um, Jermaine H. Runnels, are you on the Jeremiah Smith? It Smith train. It appears the hype is legit. Look, I, I am always hesitant to get very excited about freshmen. I've seen it play out before. Um, it doesn't always end well in terms of, you know, year one, not to say that it can't happen. There's certainly been freshmen that have been very exciting in Ohio state. I also look at the depth at the receiver room and I'm like, there's not 
you know, th- th- there's not just a clear, obvious place for Jeremiah Smith. Now, there's not a blockage. That Marvin Harrison position is wide open, uh, but he's going to have to compete with Carnell Tate, uh, you know, Jaden Ballard, guys that have more experience than him. With all of that said, Jeremiah Smith was damn impressive on the couple days that we were out at practice. Cheers to that. As Dave Biddle said on our um, instant reaction, you know, he's listed at 6'3", probably actually bigger than that, moves really well, um, wearing that number four jersey, like Santonio Holmes. Uh, He has some nice catches out there. He looks the part. So, you know, if there is a freshman wide receiver that's going to come in and break the mold, because remember, Chris Olave, end of his freshman year was when you started to hear his name, the Michigan game and the block punt and things like that. Garrett Wilson, it's kind of that second half of his freshman year. He started to come on. You started to really see it. The hype really started to build um, or come to fruition at that point. Marvin Harrison Jr. It was the Rose Bowl when Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson didn't play. Um, Emeka played in that game. Didn't have as big of a game, obviously, as as Marvin Harrison or, or Jack. Oh, Jackson Smith and Jigba, another one. Um, played his freshman year, didn't do a ton. I don't remember how many catches he had, but he was he was pretty limited. Explosive sophomore year. Um, Emeka, sophomore year is when it came on. Carnell Tate played in, I think, almost every game, if not every game last year on offense. Had one touchdown, had some nice catches, but you know wasn't like all of a sudden a superstar. Now, I know that Jeremiah Smith is different. Not only was he the number one receiver in the country, he was the number one overall prospect in the country. He is the highest wide receiver, ranked wide receiver coming out of high school, I believe, ever. So this kid is special. There's no doubt about that. Um, you know, it's just the 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 only. I think if if you were anywhere else, you would be all aboard this hype train. I just know how Brian Hartline's done it. You have to be able to do everything that they want require from the wide receivers to get on the field. And look, I think Jeremiah Smith will be on the field. But is it going to happen year one, you know, starting wide receiver, playing a ton of snaps, catching tons of passes? I don't know. But I am definitely more excited about him than I've been about any of these receivers. And I just listed a bunch of good ones. And those weren't guys that just like all of a sudden turned into good ones, right? Except Chris Olave. They were all highly recruited kids that people were excited about. And I was more you know, keep the foot on the brake, foot on the brake type of thing. Um, and you know, I think that's kind of how it played out. But Jeremiah Smith, a different, different, uh, different player for sure. Um, Jermaine Runnels also asked Montgomery at right guard. We already talked about that. And does Jibu keep the head coaching basketball job? I think that's a really interesting question. We had a conversation uh, amongst the media people before. I think it was the Nebraska game. Like, what would Jake Diebler have to do? to really make this a tough decision for, uh, you know, Gene Smith, Ross Bjork. It's, you know, they were not anticipating when firing Chris Holtman that there would be this run that makes Jake Diebler a candidate for the job. He was just the assistant coach ready to handle this interim position, which is not an easy thing to do. I honestly, for him to, as of right now, no, I don't think he does. And honestly, I don't think, He's going to anyway. I think Ross Bjork will want to make a, you know, this is will be his first big coaching hire at Ohio State. I think you want to go and, and get your guy, right? I do think it would be pretty impressive or pretty important, excuse me, to keep Jake Diebler on staff as a guy who has worked with these players, knows these players well, um, you know, that helps possibly keep them out of the transfer portal because they are a lot of them very close to Jake Diebler. So, you know, and Jake Diebler is a good coach, but I, I do think that part of it would be important. Um, but I think if, if Jake Diebler, I think you'd have to, I don't know, if he got to the second weekend of the NCAA tournament, something Chris Holtman was never able to do. I think that's at least when the conversation starts, like making the NCAA tournament would be great, but you know, you, you got hot and, and whatnot. Um, that would be a huge achievement. I don't want to undersell that, but does that get him the head coaching job? I don't think so. But if you get to the second weekend, we're talking a sweet 16 appearance, something that hasn't happened since Thad Mata. 
man, I think that's definitely a part of the conversation. Now, I also think with Jake Diebler, something that if that does happen, Ohio State will have to assess and any other program that decides to take a look at Jake Diebler, you know, after the season, if there are some, I think you have to assess like, is this Jake Diebler coaching? Is this him as the coach that's gotten this? Is it, you know, the firing that kind of lit a fire, so to speak. And again, wrote this story earlier, go read it um, on Bucknuts. You know, did the fire just kind of light something? Is it just, you know, having a, a player's coach, interim coach, you know, the players can be a bit more free with their play. You know, is that real beyond this little run here, however long it goes? You know, you have to evaluate Jake Diebler as the coach and not Jake Diebler as like the guy who's kind of taking over here briefly. Can he lead a program long term? And, you know, I think if you're Ohio State, you probably are going to go hire a guy who's done that. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of names that have been thrown around out there. But so that's why I don't think Jake Diebler keeps the job. But again, if you could make it to that second weekend, I think, you know, questions are a little bit different. Uh, Matthew Miller, all love, but you need a haircut, Pat. I absolutely need a haircut. I also meant to shave before we got on. If you're not watching this live, uh, beard's pretty long, hair's pretty long. I usually let the hair grow out in the winter. Uh, this has been a little bit longer. I started it a little bit earlier than I normally do just because I was busy and didn't get a haircut. And I've been meaning to cut my hair. And by get a haircut, uh, my girlfriend cuts my hair for me because I just buzz it. So it's pretty easy. Save Save a couple bucks there. Um, but yes, need a haircut, need a shave. It's coming. I just, you know, this week with spring practice coming back, I didn't have time for anything next week's spring break, right. For them. So I'll have time to do that. Um, Matthew Miller also said, we talked about this a little bit. I heard we have stand up defensive ends at time this season. Like this has been a part of Jim Knowles is off. That's kind of what the Jack position, or excuse me, Jim Knowles defense. That's kind of been the Jack position, um, with the way that they use them and, and guys standing up moving around, trying to create confusion. Again, I don't, I don't think it happens. I just don't, I don't, you, you use what works and what we know works is, you know, the two linebackers, the three cornerbacks, the three safeties. Is there time maybe to mix it in? I guess, um, you know, would it help JT and Jack down the road? You know, if they end up in a three, four system. Yeah. Like for sure. And that's great. But if you're Jim Knowles, you know, your job is to win football games, not toy around with the defense to help these guys draft stock down the road. You know, if you can do that, if you want to do it in games where you're winning by a decent amount, or you think maybe it's a change up at a point that would throw the offense off with kind of a bare front or something fine. But you know, I just, just my mind stick with what works. You know, you, you've proven to find, you found something last year and it's not like you've got a bunch of guys that left and now you have to redo it again. Um, here's a good one. Jason Rollison, do all five quarterbacks stay? That is a big room. It is a big room. It is a big room. The, like I said earlier, I don't think I can remember five scholarship quarterbacks, especially with the talent that each of these guys have. Um, do all five stay? Look, I, I assume everyone heard Devin Brown's quote this week about, you know, kind of defending himself. And, and I said it on our on our show midweek, the, the instant reaction show on Tuesday. Like, I think Devin Brown is just kind of sick of answering questions and hearing about the fact that he's going to transfer. When he said from day one, came to Ohio State, he doesn't care about the competition. He knew there'd be competition. He's here to compete to be a starting quarterback every year. And that's what he's done. And, you know, there's never been a talk from him about entering the transfer portal. You don't hear rumors about it other than people speculating. So I think he just kind of was fed up with it. And maybe he went a bit too far with saying these people live in their mom's basement and, and all that. But, you know, I, I can understand why you know, you've been clear. You've stuck with your word. Now, he will have a decision to make after spring based on how spring goes, what he wants, just like all these guys. Um I mean, it's it's crazy to think that they would keep all five, right? Like, if you, you know, you go into fall camp with five scholarship quarterbacks, you know, guys that were on the cusp or were five-star quarterbacks, most of them, um, and Will Howard, who's, you know, played four years. So, 
Yeah, I, I mean, I guess just the numbers game tells you you would bet no, right, that at least one of them would leave. Um, but, again, Lincoln Keyhold saying the same thing. You know, he's like, I'm not, you know, I'm here learning. And, you know, he made a good point. He was asked about, you know, do people forget that you guys are college students and humans? And I think it's a really important thing to, to always emphasize. Like, you know, people ask me all the time about certain guys who have never, you know, never gotten on the field three, four years in, you know, um, I, I don't want to name names, but the you know guys that just kind of stick around and you know you you hear their name every once in a while, you're like oh yeah, he's still on the roster. Um, why you know why do they stay? You know they could go play somewhere else. Well, there's a whole other side to this life, right? Besides football, you know these guys have apartments and friends and girlfriends. You know sometimes they end up having kids while they're in college, and so you just when you go and transfer, you know I transferred. After my freshman year of college, I went to Denison my first year and I transferred to Ohio State. And, you know, it's, I mean, doing it after your freshman year, I guess, is one thing because you're packing up anyway to leave the dorms. But, and I was fortunate to have a bunch of friends for, that I already knew at Ohio State. But, like, you're packing up your whole life and you're going someplace else. And a lot of times you don't know what that's going to be like. Um, you know, you're just leaving, especially if you've been somewhere for three years, four years, whatever it may be. You know, you're leaving a lot behind and, you know, it's off the football field, but that's part of it. You know, also these kids are students too. And some of them are, are very, you know, serious about their athletics or their academics, excuse me. And, you know, you're in a program and you're, you're heading towards a degree from a place like Ohio state. Are you going to go mix that up uh, by, by transferring someplace else? And maybe you play, but you also have to think about, you know, are you going to play enough to, to get to the NFL and put that, behind you, the college part of it behind you. I don't know. It's just always something to think about with them. Um, quarterbacks are obviously a different animal because only one guy plays and, and all that. But, you know, I guess to answer the question, I would say if I were going to bet, I would say they enter with four in, in the fall, but I couldn't tell you who's going to transfer based on what they said. Um, you know, I think and we didn't talk to Julian Sain or, or Aaron Nolan, so I don't know where their minds are, but you know, they're new to this. Why not stick it out? You know, I think Ryan Day would be pretty happy if you have five guys in there. He says he wants four. What does five mean? Uh, just an update. The women's basketball team now down 10 points, 54-44, with 235 left in the third quarter. Not looking good for the Buckeyes, which would be disappointing, but not the end of the road. All right, we're going to wrap this one up. Another episode of the Bucknuts Happy Hour. Oh, real quick, Mello. I appreciate you asking about Manchester United. Um, I don't want to go into that because this is a Buckeyes podcast and I don't want to lose all of our people, but uh, you know, feel free to message me. We can talk about Manchester United. If you're in Columbus, we've got a, uh, we've got a bar we go to for all the games. I don't know where you live, but you're more than welcome to come out and hang out with us. Anyway, wrapping it up. Um, if you're not familiar or if you haven't looked at the schedule, the Buckeyes are off next week for spring break. So we will not have, Anything over at the Woody Hayes Athletic Center will resume that next. I think it's that next Tuesday, so a week from Tuesday uh, when everything picks back up. But we've got plenty of stuff from this week. Lots of content will be going up on Buck Nuts. So you know, follow along, subscribe to Buck Nuts for your VIP content. Um, I've tried to do some more of that. Ohio State had a punter for the 2024 class commit. Didn't have a scholarship punter on the roster. We've got plenty of stuff on that on the site already. So check us out over at Bucknuts if you haven't. Like, subscribe, YouTube, Facebook, follow on Twitter, all that good stuff. We appreciate it. Instagram, that too. That's become a bit more of a priority. Anyway, Buckeye fans, I hope you all have a good weekend. And uh, yeah, like I said off the top, it's nice to have some football back. It's not a game, but it's football. Cheers, everybody. <laughs>